Ethan Martin, hi, is currently the director of strate user strategy at the super creative digital firm Buckwild. I think I say this every month, but I'm always really fascinated by people who are killing it in their careers and took a really tr untraditional path to get there. I've known Ethan for a few years, both personally and professionally, and he's as good as they get. Every time I talk to him, I learn something new, whether it's a weird parallel universe theory about the Bernstein Bears, <laughs> or <laughs> that he used to design and sew Wu-Tang Clan ski clothes. He has survived many twists and turns in an incredible year, and he has literally survived some health challenges. He gave us a really huge scare a couple years ago. The best part about him is his no bullshit perseverance. He's both a serious guy and super laid back, and I'm lucky to consider him a friend. Everybody welcome Ethan Martin. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. You just kind of did my job introducing myself, so that's it. Thank you for coming. Um, no, this is a really great opportunity, um, and I'm really excited to be here in front of all of you guys. Um, Creative Mornings is a really great thing all over the world, and it's really awesome to have one in Sacramento. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I do, I present to people a lot, but it's usually um, clients or students, um, and it's usually about something very specific. So uh, it's a little bit weird to be talking about myself, so hopefully you guys find it uh, interesting and informative. Um, and yeah, survival. Um, I have managed to survive for 36 years, uh, <laughs> which is really not a whole lot. Um, but as Rebecca mentioned, um, I have had some roadblocks that I've overcome. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and also, um, a few of the things that uh, have kind of like shaped my perspective on uh, life, but also um, my professional career. Um, so I'm going to share a few of those things with you guys. Um, but a little bit about myself first. Um, I do work for a digital agency here in Sacramento called Buckwild. Uh, we do uh, web design, web app development, uh, social media, um, and a lot of content production, so video, photography, um, animation, copywriting, and strategy um, for a pretty cool mix of clients. Um, some of the recent ones, uh, Coachella, um, we worked with them. We built their website for the last festival cycle. Um, Dark Horse Wine is, um, they're a wine brand. They're relatively new, but they've uh, really kind of exploded in the past couple of years and kind of gained a lot of traction. Um, we worked with them quite a bit. Um, we don't, not only did their website, uh, we produced a lot of social content for them um, and have had the opportunity to um, really kind of shape their brand language and aesthetic, which has been really fun. Um, we do, this is probably the most mainstream example, but we do a lot of uh, really interesting kind of enterprise work as well. So we work with Pand Pandora on their uh, B2B and advertising clients. Um, and then we have a bunch of different uh, content that we produce. Um, I didn't personally work on this one, but uh, we did the promotion video for Amazon Go last year. Uh, when that came out, that's their cashierless uh, grocery store. Um, that was probably the highest profile project we've done in quite a while. Uh, it had millions of views in the first day and was parodied on Jimmy Kimmel, no big deal. Um, <laughs> so uh, again, I didn't work on that, but props to the crew who did. Um, my personal role at Buckwild is I'm the director of user strategy. Um, so I had kind of an interesting pathway to get there, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a second, but I started out as a designer um, and now um, mostly what I do is uh, go to meetings and draw diagrams and say smart stuff. Um, but really, uh, kind of one of our core tenets as an agency is to um, balance what a brand is looking for, like what are their business objectives, what are the things that they care about, what's true and honest about them, but then run it through this litmus test of their users. Like, does anybody actually give a shit about this stuff? Um, so my job, and really everyone's job, but uh, I'm kind of the keeper of this flag is to um, be the steward for the users and make sure that we're saying things that people care about. Um, so my origin story, as Rebecca mentioned, I had kind of a weird uh, pathway, um, a little bit different than most folks. I grew up in a small town in Vermont. Um, I really always liked design, but I didn't actually know 
what design was. Um, I think it really all started with the Reebok pump. Does anybody remember that? Uh, so I was a little kid, and I was probably like eight or nine years old, um, like the late 80s, early 90s to me. That was like the pinnacle of sneaker design. Uh, you had like the Reebok pump, the early Air Jordans, uh, the Air Max was coming out. Um, I didn't actually understand why I liked any of this stuff, but it was, um, it was really this kind of interesting mix of technology and style, which I really gravitated towards. Um, of course, I couldn't afford any of these things. There was no way that my parents were going to spend triple digits on sneakers for an eight-year-old. Uh, so I spent a lot of time drawing my own sneakers and drawing ads for those sneakers. Um, and uh, in a post-mortem with uh, any of my school teachers, that probably wouldn't have been a good time to tell me that there was a career in design and that people could do that for a living because uh, that never occurred to me for quite a few years after. Um, probably because the other thing that I was really interested in was skiing. Um, I was a freestyle skier growing up and um, had a really fantastic opportunity to, uh, in high school, I went to a ski academy on a full scholarship, which basically meant uh, I got to go to school for a few hours a day and then go ski and do dry land training for the rest of the time, which was a pretty awesome way to go to school. Um, it also gave me the opportunity to travel all over the U.S. and compete, um, which gave me a pretty good perspective on kind of the world and the United States, which was, uh, I probably wouldn't have gotten that as uh, just a kid in an insular town in Vermont had I not had the opportunity to do this. Um, as a result of this, uh, when I graduated high school, I um, got a job, uh, saved every penny that I had, uh, and packed up my car and drove across the country to Lake Tahoe, sight unseen, had never been there before. Um, but at the time, it was uh, really a hotbed for the ski industry, uh, very comparable to like what the Bay Area would be for technology or design right now. Um, after a few years, I uh, started to kind of, one, just get fatigued and kind of burnt out on it, but also kind of colliding with the reality of being an adult and having to pay rent and uh, have a job and all of that stuff. Um, I really started to burn out on skiing. Um, and then one day I was uh, filming, I was talent for a commercial for one of the result resorts up there and uh, I was going really fast down this really steep hill and it was a springtime so the snow was really punchy. Um, so I caught an edge and uh, hit a tree really hard. Uh, and it turns out trees are much stronger than human bodies. Um, so I was really, I was, quote unquote lucky, um, I shattered three ribs and broke two vertebrae, um, which I was very lucky, uh, I wasn't paralyzed or anything like that. Um, really the only impact was kind of like nine months of limited activity and uh, physical therapy. Um, so not the end of the world, but it kind of put a nail in the coffin for uh, being a professional skier. So in a gross oversimplification of time and space, uh, the next step, um, there was a local outerwear company um, that I knew, uh, some of the guys there, and uh, I convinced them to hire me to design for them. Uh, and not only design, but um, head up a sub-label which was targeted at uh, millennials and was a little bit edgier. Uh, this would become a pattern for my career ever since, uh, millennials. Um, so I worked for them and uh, it was a really incredible learning opportunity. Um, I learned about uh, product design and uh, overseas manufacturing, um, but also brand building. Um, because it was a small company, I got to wear a lot of hats um, in kind of the cycle of apparel manufacturing, at least in this industry, there's a time when like you're designing the clothing and then there's a time when you're designing uh, all of the ads. So I said, I can do that, I can figure it out. Um, same thing for the website, um, and MySpace was a really big deal at the time, so we were a smaller company, didn't have a ton of budget, so uh, we had a MySpace profile and were able to kind of connect directly with uh, these crazy kids who wanted our stuff. Uh, didn't seem like a big deal at the time, but turns out that was called social media marketing. Who knew? Um, so my attention and kind of uh, interest started to shift more towards like the graphic design aspect of the business. Um, I think a lot of it was uh, really the turnaround time. Like when you design clothes, uh, usually you have to wait like six months to get samples and it can be up to two years before you get a finished product in your hand. 
Uh, so by that time, you've gone through two design cycles in the middle of it, and you're like, I'm so over this stuff by the time I get it. Uh, so comparatively, like graphic design was uh, pretty great, and there was a lot more flexibility there. Um, so I decided I wanted to focus my attention there, um, and I decided I should probably get good at it. Um, because I was already an adult, uh, I already had a job in uh, the profession, uh, going back to school full-time didn't really seem like a logical thing to do. Um, so I found the Academy of Art had their design curriculum posted online. Uh, so I literally like got their books, posted the, got the ones that I couldn't find at the library on Amazon, uh, and literally put myself through the Academy of Art design curriculum on my own. Um, then uh, worked at a, another resort up there doing design for them, uh, started freelancing a lot, and uh, again, in another kind of gross oversimplification of time, uh, a door opened at Buckwild, uh, moved to Sacramento, and uh, here we are. Um, moved to Sacramento uh, about seven years ago uh, with my girlfriend and now wife at the time. Um, life was really fantastic. I um, was working for a really cool agency, uh, doing cool stuff. Um, started to fall in love with Sacramento for all of the reasons that I'm sure I don't have to explain to you people. Um, had cats. Uh, <laughs> life was great. Um, then one day, um, oops, uh, I woke up and uh, had a really bad stomach ache. Um, so what, <coughs> what I failed to mention, um, when I was in my early teens, like 12 or 13, uh, I, was I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, uh, which is essentially like chronic inflammation of the digestive tract. Um, it never really slowed me down very much. Uh, I was always able to kind of manage it through diet and exercise. Um, but I woke up one day in the springtime and it was different. Uh, this was a flare up unlike anything I'd ever felt before. Um, my diagnosis or <coughs> the way that they fix that is to cut your large intestine out, or at least for me, uh, which is exactly as awesome as it sounds like. Um, so we did that um, <coughs> and then things got rough. Uh, in the pathology, which is when they kind of like cut your intestine out and then look at it to see what was wrong with it later, uh, they found a tumor. Um, I had stage two colon cancer. Um, so there was this really uh, crazy week, which again is kind of a gross oversimplification, where um, my father died, my mother-in-law passed away from her battle with cancer, and I found out that I was going to need chemo and radiation. Um, life as told by Hagar the Horrible. Uh, um, so yeah, that was pretty crazy, um, but decided that we were gonna do it, um, I was prescribed uh, 28 days of radiation and uh, six cycles of chemotherapy. Um, I decided to, as much as I can, uh, keep working through it to kind of like keep grounded in reality. Um, so my coworkers, some of you guys are here, uh, lots of people in the community really, really came through and it was incredible uh, how much support we saw. Um, so thank you guys who are here in the audience um, and thank you to everyone who isn't. Um, but that was really incredible, and uh, particularly the folks at Buckwild. Uh, the other day I was looking through uh, some of the work that I did during that period, and it was not good. Uh, <laughs> so thank you guys for your patience with me during that time. Um, then uh, one day I woke up, uh, I was, had just finished my fourth cycle of chemo, was done with radiation, and uh, was feeling pretty rough, but uh, there was kind of a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, had been feeling really good the day before, but then woke up that morning with really, really horrible stomach pain. Uh, went to the ER and um, they found out that uh, there was internal bleeding and uh, the combination of radiation, chemotherapy, and remnants of the disease was essentially liquefying my intestines. Um, so funny story about this photo. Uh, when I go, I'm usually pretty quiet and reserved. Uh, when I come up from anesthesia, I am turned up. <laughs> so this is me in the ER after uh, just undergoing this emergency procedure uh, with this surgeon who was just telling me 
uh, yeah, you're probably dying, uh, and insisted that my wife uh, take a selfie with me, this person. Uh, so, um, so that meant uh, five days in the ICU, um, and I had to decide, uh, basically had to decide to end treatment early, um, which is, uh, as you can imagine, uh, causes quite the uh, existential crisis of do I uh, continue this treatment, which is demonstrably killing me, or do I end it early and raise my chances of getting this other thing later on, which will also likely kill me. Um, so all of the things that go on with that type of decision making went on. Um, I decided not to continue with treatment and decided to try to get better. Um, there's a thing about cancer and about uh, kind of the end of treatment that nobody ever really talks about. Uh, it's described as this kind of like finish line, like, hey, you did it, you finished treatment, that's awesome. Uh, when you're doing it, it does not feel like that at all. Uh, you still feel terrible um, and you have just gone from literally fighting death every single day to learning how to live again. Uh, so there's this pretty rough adjustment period. Um, long story short, uh, I did it. Um, so one of the things, uh, I ran a marathon uh, almost a day, almost a year to the day after uh, I was in the hospital in the ICU. Um, running marathons is a pick thing that I picked up along the way that I failed to mention. Uh, but this was, this was a really uh, important milestone for me, and this was kind of uh, like the dignifier of survival. Like, I did it. Um, so not only did I run the marathon, but I set a PR. So that was pretty awesome. I felt pretty good about myself. So, survival. Um, now you can kind of, I guess, that's my resume. You guys can uh, take this information that I'm gonna share uh, and see if I'm qualified to speak on it. Um, Really, these next few points are, um, they're applicable to life in general um, and things that I've gained. Uh, this experience has given me a lot of perspective, but I really tried to think about coming uh, to talk to you guys today. Uh, what are the things that are applicable to creatives? Uh, so I have three kind of pillars of my own um, that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, the first of all, uh, be present. Um, this is a really important thing to do. Um, obviously, like we're a very screen-driven society and there's things fighting for our attention all the time. Um, but that's a challenge, right? How many of you guys are multitaskers? Feels good, right? Multitasking feels good. Like you're getting shit done. Like you're doing lots and lots and lots of stuff all at once. Um, I think multitasking is actually pretty lazy behavior. Uh, because it's a lot easier to do a bunch of things just okay than do one thing really great. Um, so there's this guy, uh, Josh Foyer, and he talks about this thing called the okay plateau, um, which is this behavior that a lot of people have, um, a lot of adults in particular. Uh, we do the same things every single day. Uh, he uses the example of typing. Like, how many of you guys type every day, all day, or at least quite a bit? How many of you guys are better, faster, more accurate at typing than you were six months ago? Good, for you. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, it's unusual to uh, kind of progress at something like typing. Like we, um, in a lot of our things in life, uh, we reach this level of kind of like acceptable proficiency and then it's just okay and then that's good. Uh, to me, multitasking is like the epitome of the okay plateau. Like we have all of these things that we're doing and we can do like just good enough that it's kind of okay um, and we can get by. Um, but as creatives and particularly as professional creatives, if we're working for clients or especially if we're working for ourselves, um, we kind of owe it to ourselves to be a little bit better than okay. Um, because if you're just okay, there's going to be somebody who is really great who's going to come along and they're going to put you out of business. Um, and that's not a good way to survive. Uh, so the next thing, um, I think about this a lot and this has been really, um, really kind of instrumental in my kind of career pathway. 
um, is thinking about uh, thinking beyond your tools. Um, we have so many really amazing tools at our disposal today uh, in all sorts of fields, um, but we're really at this kind of dangerous tipping point where uh, our tools are becoming a master of us instead of the other way around. Um, I think the creative fields are really, um, they've been one of the biggest beneficiaries, but also the biggest victims of tools. Um, there's been so much disruption in the past 10, 20 years, uh, like with digital coming out, um, and it's just going to get crazier. Uh, artificial intelligence is going to come out. Uh, it's happening. There's nothing that we can do to stop it. Uh, get ready. Um, so, and I think it's really interesting that creatives in general, um, like a lot of it, what it has meant to be a creative is just to be like really good at your specific tool. Uh, so the barrier to entry to so much of what we do has been really high for so long, like a professional ca camera, uh, a printing press, uh, even a studio for a musician. Uh, that was all really expensive and inaccessible. Uh, so very few people could access it and then had the time to kind of master those tools. Uh, so really, to be a creative, you just had to be really good at using a tool, right? Um, but now the barrier to entry to so many of these things has changed, uh, and really, um, all of these tools have really been commodified. Uh, like, for design, like, Photoshop was kind of like the go-to design software, and that was like $2,000 to buy it or something like that. Now Sketch is kind of the standard uh, web design software, and a license is $99. Um, so anybody can get these tools, anybody can get really good at them. Um, but I think this is, should be really freeing for creatives in general in that uh, if we don't have to worry about the tools so much, then we can worry about solving problems. Um, and I think that's kind of the core of creativity, like no matter what field or what your kind of division of creativity is, uh, it's really about solving the problem. So thinking beyond kind of the tools that you have at your disposal, um, is really important, and uh, it's really important for us at Buckwild. Um, it's something that we're pushing our capabilities a lot. It's really important for me um, as a human, but also as a professional, um, because it's changing all the time. Um, maintaining perspective. Uh, so this is really important for a lot of things. Um, but definitely in our jobs, uh, it's easy to get really overwhelmed uh, by the things like answering emails or like a client has a crisis or something has to happen. Like right now, this Instagram post has to go live right now. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Nobody really cares about that. Uh, it's going to be okay. Um, so, um, it's, yeah, it's really important to think about uh, what we're actually doing in our everyday uh, lives. Um, one of the things that I try to do, I find an incredible amount of comfort. I know a lot of people don't, uh, but I find uh, the vastness of space uh, and the universe incredibly comfortable. Uh, just knowing that we are just this small speck floating through this thing that's bigger that we can even imagine. Uh, when I have a bad day or like I'm on deadline or whatever, just thinking about the bigger picture uh, is incredibly refreshing. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, I just, it's like a warm blanket on a cold snowy day. I love it. Um, and one of the uh, things that I love to do um, when I'm having, I love to do it anytime, but particularly when, um, I'm having a bad day or having a bad time, uh, is go to an open space and look at the moon. Have you guys like really looked at the moon? Like really look at it. Uh, feel your feet on the ground and then look at the moon and imagine that a human being had the audacity and imagination and creativity to think it was a good idea to go to the moon <laughs> and put their feet on that thing and then come back. And they did it, and they lived, they survived. Uh, that is incredible to me. Uh, so I like to go out to an open place, feel my feet on the ground, just feel that distance between the moon and I, and then look beyond that at the stars and feel that distance. Uh, 
and then everything is okay. Uh, so thank you. <laughs>